morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Secondary Patents on Both Sides of the Pond, Impact of Clinical Trials on Patentability. I'm Jamie Barkham and I'll be your moderator today. It is my pleasure to welcome our presenters, Maeve Flynn and Yi Yi Yang. Maeve is a European and Chartered Patent Attorney based in Finnegan's London office, and Yi Yi is counsel in Finnegan's DC office. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite all of you to participate by submitting questions. This is an interactive webinar. Just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webcast interface and type your, type your question into the Q&A window and then click Submit. Your questions will be answered during our question and answer session, which will take place at the end of the presentation. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. Without any further ado, I'll turn it over to our, presentation, our presenters to begin our presentation. Welcome, Maeve and Yi. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Jamie. So here, um, this is our agenda for today. So um, as you know, we're essentially focusing on clinical trials and to what extent they affect um, our ability to get secondary patents um, on both sides of the pond. So we're going to try and give you the perspective from Europe and the perspective from the US as well. So we're going to start off um, looking at clinical trials as prior art public use. So to what extent the actual, um, the actual occurrence of the trial can itself be a problem from a patentability perspective. And then we're going to move on to looking at clinical trial documents as printed publications. So how do those, how does the publication of those documents affect the patentability of, of your secondary, uh, secondary patents? Um, you'll find as, as we talk through those two first topics that there are significant differences from the approach um, in, in Europe and in the US, um, and we'll try and um, bring out some of those as, as we talk through those topics. Um, the third topic, Sanofi Watson claiming, Yi Yi will lead that because that is something that you can do in the US. It's, it's a strategy that may help with um, the fact that there are clinical trial documents out there that are relevant printed publications. So Sanofi Watson claiming is a potential strategy and we'll go into that in some detail. And then finally, we'll finish with a topic where in many ways, the considerations are quite similar in both Europe and the US. We use quite different terminology to describe this, but we'll, we'll talk a bit about what data you might need when filing your patent application, the ability that you might have to use post-filed data in support of patentability and, and uh, how, that, how that works. So our first topic, clinical trial as prior art public use. Um, I'm going to start here and I'm, I'm going to jump right in with, with the European case. Um, most of the discussion from a European perspective, you'll see that um, most of the slides start with this T number. Um, for people not um, familiar with European practice, the T at the start of the case number means it's from the uh, Board of Appeals at the European Patent Office. So most of the European case law that I'm going to touch on um, comes from the Board of Appeals at the European Patent Office. Um, these are important decisions because the European Patent Office decides whether you get a patent in the first place, and the European Patent also, uh, pat European Patent Office will also um, deal with any oppositions that may be filed, so post-grant um, challenges that are filed before the EPO. So these Board of Appeals decisions kind of give you the framework for um, all those decisions, so before the Patent Office. Of course, from a European perspective, we might also want to consider uh, decisions of the um, national courts, and going forward, we'll need to also dis to consider decisions from the, the UPC, the new Unified Patent Court, which will be very interesting. But today, I'm going to primarily focus on T decisions from the Boards of Appeal at the European Patent Office. So. We're starting with clinical trials and how they affect novelty. So is your patent, are your, 
is the subject matter of your claims novel in view of a clinical trial that took place prior to the priority date that of, of your patent. So does the fact that that clinical trial took place affect the novelty of your claims? Does it take away the novelty of your claims? And this case here, T7 of 07, relates to a specific formulation. Um, it was a contraceptive in a specific micronized form. Um, it's actually a buyer product um, known as Yasmin, a particular contraceptive. And I believe there were also um, interesting cases about this, uh, this patent family also in the US. But this European case uh, related to the, the formulation and the clinical trials were conducted with that formulation, so a formulation that was within the scope of the, the, the claims of the patent, those clinical trials took place before the patent was filed. So the Board of Appeal looked at the facts and the facts showed that the trial investigators had entered into confidentiality agreements, but the trial participants had not. So there was no specific confidentiality agreement between the trial participants and the trial organizers. So in view of those facts, the Board of Appeal found that the trial participants were essentially considered to be members of the public. There was no obligation of confidentiality um, there. So they were essentially members of the public. Um, moreover, there was the whole issue of what was happening with any unused medication. So there was no requirement in this set of facts to return the unused medications. And the board found that the trial organizers had effectively lost control of the medication and that those participants could if they wanted to, they could dispose of the medication in any way they wanted, and they could if they wanted to, um, they probably didn't, but the point was that they could um, look at that formulation, they could analyze it, and they could find out that it was in this specific micronized form that was claimed. So the medication was deemed to have been made available to the public, and that was deemed to be a public disclosure of that claimed formulation. So this, this case, which is from 2011, is, is quite a cautionary tale, really. It's, it's quite a negative case for patentees because um, th their patent was lost um, because the participants were deemed to be members of the public. So this was kind of the backdrop in Europe. And the fact that a clinical trial took place could, on the basis of this decision, be a significant problem if you were trying to subsequently claim a formulation that was used in that trial. But then in a later case, where the facts are actually reasonably similar, this is a much more positive case for, for the patentee. So this case is from December 2022, T670 of 20. And this is also, this is another formulation case. So this is a formulation of idoxaban. And again, the Board of Appeal, they looked at the facts. And here, the clinical trial participants had received the formulation prior to patent filing. And the opponent essentially followed the kind of reasoning that was in that case we just looked at and said, well, the skilled person, they could have obtained the tablets and they could have determined the active ingredients and thus these formulation claims lack novelty. They even had evidence to show that tablets were taken at home by the trial participants and not all of the unused tablets were returned at the end of the study. But the outcome of this case is, is different to that last one. So here the board said, OK, the trial participants um, were subject to implied confidentiality. They were not members of the public. And the, the evidence that seemed to be really um, important in this case was that th there was evidence before the board that said that the trial investigators, um, they were following particular protocols. They were carrying out the studies in accordance with EMEA guidelines for good clinical practice. And when you looked at that guidelines, um, the guidelines required strict adherence with a particular protocol. And that protocol said that all trial participants must return unused medication. So it was pretty clear that the trial participants understood that they were supposed to give the unused medication back. And it wasn't actually determinative that 
not all of the unused tablets were returned. What was what was important was that there were obligations and that everything had been carried out in accordance with this protocol. And on the basis of those facts, the board said, well, actually here, no, it's, it's, it's OK. The formulation is novel in view of that clinical trial that took place before patent filing. So, so things look a bit more positive, <laughs> um, but essentially it's going to be fact-based in Europe. Um, if a clinical trial has taken place before the filing of your formulation patent, it arguably is going to be difficult to show that that formulation is novel. You're going to have to have the right documents in place to show that there was the appropriate confidentiality and the appropriate obligations. So I've just got one more European case before I pass to Yi Yi, who's going to talk about the situation, the analogous situation in the US. But this, this case is slightly different. Um, it's arguably more about the documents than about the fact that the actual trial, the, the actual trial taking place. But what's relevant here is that the confidentiality, it's not simply relevant that the participants are under obligations of confidentiality. It's the people that those participants potentially might be speaking to that you might also need to have obligations of confidentiality there or, or to show that they exist. So this case related to um, zoledronic acid for use in a method of treating osteoporosis and a document was provided to those considering enrolling in the trial and they were actively encouraged to discuss it with members of their family and their doctor. And the finding was that the people that they were encouraged to discuss it with, so those people who were one step removed, there was no relationship between those people and the trial sponsor. There was no confidentiality whatsoever there. So that particular document there was part of the prior art. And this particular patent, um, it wasn't just a second med medical use. It was zoledronic acid for use in a method of treating osteoporosis, but it was a specific dosage regime. And various dosages were actually disclosed in this document that was then deemed to have be part of the prior art. So, um, so that was significant here. But I will come back to this particular case when we're talking about um, inventive step and I'll tell you the, the outcome. But but for the purposes of thinking about who's a member of the public, who's not, um, this, this case tells us that we need to think more broadly, not just about the trial participants, but about um, who they may be speaking to and who they may be sharing particular documents with. So I'll pass to Yi Yi now, who's going to tell us about the situation in the U.S. Thanks, Maeve. Uh, in the U.S., it depends on the facts, too, but I feel like the court's decisions are similar to Europe. Maybe look a little friendly, but it depends on the facts, too. For example, the first case here is the Day versus Synovian. In this case, both parties have their own patents, and both parties have their own clinical trial studies. And Synovian wanted to use their own clinical trial st study as prior use art, to destroy the novelty uh, of the Dave patent, which is a formulation patent. It is because the claim, uh, the, uh, their clinical trial study was conducted with the claimed formulation. So the only question is whether there was a public accessibility to the formulation information uh, during the trial. So the facts in this case are the patients were told some information about the, dr about the drug. First of all, the patients were told the active ingredient of the drug. They also were told that they were given different doses of the drug compared to placebo, but the formulation per se was never ever disclosed to the patients in the entire process. Secondly, the patients signed consent forms. In the consent forms, the patients were told, okay, you have to be the only person taking the drug, and also you need to return all the unused medication um, to, the, to the hospital, but you can freely talk to your doctors about your condition and about the drug. So there's no restriction in the consent form per se, about whether the patient can discuss about the drug with other parties. Based on this, the district court thought, okay, because there's no restriction on the patients not to talk about the, the drug and everything, that's why uh, it, is, it is public use, and that's why the patent is invalid based on the clinical trial study. The Federal Circuit uh, disagreed. Uh, the Federal Circuit thought, 
the claimed formulation remained confidential. It was there was evidence and testimony showing that even as of time the complaint was filed, the formulation per se was still confidential and not in the public domain. And also, in, most importantly, the investigators they signed confidentiality agreements in the clinical trial study. In the confidential uh, confidentiality agreements, the investigators had to make sure they don't talk about this drug or condition with anyone but the patients. And also, they are responsible to for monitoring the un, unused medication it has to be returned to the hospital. So it was confidential, remained confidential as long as investigators, they were not aware of the specifics, and also they signed confidential agreements. The patients do not have to do that due to their freedom to talk to their pay, uh, doctors to share about their condition. The court also thinks Courts have routinely rejected the argument that such arrangement that invest investigators, but not the patients, sign the agreements of confidentiality it does not necessarily strip the trial of confidentiality protection or render it is accessible to the public. So this, in this case, um, it was there was no public use due to the clinical trial study. But in the next case, the facts are a little different. Um, in this case, the Provona versus Teva, um, the, the Provona predecessor company shipped the drug sample to a researcher, a professor at a hospital. And in the shipment, they also included a certificate uh, of analysis, which discloses all the components of the drug. And uh, the, the, the composition patent, the claims, uh, pretty much limitations are reviewed in the certificate analysis. Also, in the shipment, and although through the communication with the researcher, the company never ever tell the researcher not to tell this or show this to any other person. So there's no confidentiality restriction anywhere in this entire process. Um, so just report thought, oh, because it only shipped to one person uh, and uh, it's not public use. That's why the patent is not invalid. Again, the Federal Circuit in this case disagreed because according to the Federal Circuit, Unlike the day case we discussed earlier, where no invalidating patent use was found, here, because the, 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 the drug was given the researcher without any restriction at all, that's why there, there's no expectation of secrecy. Importantly, also compared to the day case, where in the, the recipients, the patients, are unsophisticated people. They, they don't know anything about drugs, and they don't know formulations, stuff like that. Here, the drug was given to a person highly skilled in the art with the full ability to know, understand, and fully disclose the invention to others. Indeed, the researcher told the, the, the court that, yes, he also conducted independent analytical testing to further confirm the contents of the, of the drug, which further shows there's a public use out there. Thanks, Yi Yi. So I think the US courts may be arguably slightly more generous, but as, as Yi Yi said, it is always going to be fact specific. But I think what it's important to remember is that at least in Europe, and in some cases also in the US, use of a medicine in a tr clinical trial could be novelty destroying for patent applications filed after that use, after that arguably public use. Um, Thinking about it a bit further, this is arguably the risk is maybe higher for second medical use patents or indeed um, for dosage patents compared to formulations. I think in a lot of circumstances, it may be easier to argue that your formulation remains secret. Whereas if you have documents out there and, and your, your patients know and their doctors know that they are taking a specific drug for a particular indication at a particular dosage, that's going to be harder to argue that those aspects of the clinical trial um, were not publicly disclosed compared to the formulation. But even with the formulation, if, you, if it's found that you've lost control of the medication or if it's found as it was in that T707 case, if it's found that the participants themselves were not restricted by confidentiality obligations, then there is a risk. So this is just something that you need to be aware of um, when uh, you're about to conduct a clinical trial. Um, 
it's important to review all patient communication documents. Um, these will be poured over in great detail in, in uh, patent challenges. So you need to um, review those documents um, and make sure that those documents clearly state those requirements to return medication and any confidentiality 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 requirements that there might be so um yeah just bear in mind that the simple fact that the trial takes place may itself be um, a novelty destroying disclosure yeah as may mentioned just now which is true i think in either europe and the us it doesn't matter if the patients actually return the medication i mean you have to have something out there in written form saying they they need to return the medication that's important Great. So moving on to our uh, second topic. So we're moving on from um, the simple fact that the trial took place more to looking at the, the documents themselves that surround um, the clinical trial. Um, as we all know, there are significant regulatory requirements about um, publishing these documents or, or, or supplying them to the relevant regulatory agencies. Um, so there are a lot of documents out there. And if your patent is challenged, these documents will be one of the first things that the patent challengers look at. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pass over to Yi Yi, who, who will sort of give you the, the, the basic situation in the US, and then I'll talk a bit about Europe. Sure, thanks, Ami. In the US, a, a clinical trial study could be used uh, for inherent anticipa anticipation against a later method treatment patent. Uh, for example, in the famous uh, Montgomery, Montgomery case, it's a very famous case, the method, uh, the method treatment claim recites a method of treating or preventing stroke uh, in the specific population of patients with partic particular risks. And the um, the method treatment claim recites a step of, of um, administering the drug to the patient, right? Uh, so in the in the court, the Federal Circuit th con concluded that the efficacy observed in a clinical trial typically is considered inherent or an inevitable result of carrying out the steps described in the uh, in the protocol. Um, because again, if you're targeting the same population patients. If you're describing the same steps of the of the of treatment, then the patient's the efficacy is inherent or inevitable natural result in the patient body. That's why there's inherency argument there. Uh, and here in this case, the court, although the parties are the opposing counsel, argued that its protocol is only describing the steps without further description of the detailed results and everything. The court thinks, okay, first of all, anticipation does not require actual reduction of to practice. It only requires enabling disclosure of uh, the limitations of the claim, right? In this case, the protocol for this drug administration is far from the abstract theory. It is an advanced stage of testing designed to secure regulatory approval. And indeed, the court also pointed out in the patent itself, the patent itself does not tell you or describe any actual results from the study either. So that's why the protocol in this case seems to be strong evidence of anticipatory, uh, inherent anticipation prior art in this case. And Europe, maybe talk about Europe right now, right now. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Yi Yi. Um, so I think this is a situation where actually things are easier at the EPO than they are in the US. So unlike um, at the US, in the US, efficacy is not held to be inherent. So what the EPO will look at is, is there an expectation of success? And I'll take you through several cases. Is there an expectation of success? So that success here essentially means therapeutic efficacy. So there's an interesting or a helpful quote here from this Board of Appe Appeal um, decision T1806 of 18. And the board there said, the fact that a clinical study is announced in a prior art disclosure does not automatically mean that its outcome was predictable and that a reasonable expectation of success had to be acknowledged. So that therapeutic efficacy is not inherent as far as the EPO are concerned. So here, the EPO are arguably more generous than the, uh, than the US courts. But let's look at some cases and we, I've got cases here where it's gone 
both ways. So this is a case where uh, the patentee was successful in arguing that there was no reasonable expectation of success on the basis of the uh, clinical trial protocol documents. So here, uh, the patent claimed um, it was a medical use claim for dispersion of nilotinib in apple sauce for the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia. And the prior art document was a pediatric investigation plan. So there was an awful lot in that plan. There was a clear disclosure of the use of nilotinib to treat CML. Um, a number of different formulations were disclosed. There were capsules. There was a dispersion in yogurt. And then there was this dispersion in apple sauce. This is the, the claimed um, formulation. But the board here said that the, you couldn't tell from the, the plan documents alone that you would get successful treatment of CML. And what was important here was that the skilled person would not have been able to predict the food effect of these different dispersions. So you had the dispersion in yogurt, you had the dispersion in apple sauce, and they said um, that the skilled person would just not have known how the bioavailability of the drug, of the nilotinib, would be affected in that formulation. So for this specific uh, set of facts, there was not a reasonable expectation of success. So, um, so this is a case where, despite the uh, publication of that pediatric investigation plan, the claims were deemed to be novel. But then, in this next uh, decision, uh, there was found to be a reasonable expectation of success. So this is the claim, this is the case that I spoke about earlier, the zoledronic acid for use in a method of treating osteoporosis. And this is a particular uh, dosage regime. The, the uh, drug is administered intravenously and intermittently, and the period between administrations is about one year. So as I said earlier, there was this disclosure, there was this document um, that disclosed uh, the compound, its use in the treatment of osteoporosis, and it also said in that document what the different dosage regimes were going to be that would be tried. So this yearly dosage was clearly disclosed. So you might think that on the basis of that disclosure, well, this, this claim lacks novelty, but they said, well, no, because the trial protocol does not directly and unambiguously disclose, and that, that's the novelty test in Europe. So the protocol does not directly and unambiguously disclose the effective treatment of osteoporosis as defined in the claims. So you've got pretty much everything that's claimed, but you haven't got a clear disclosure of effective treatment of osteoporosis. So they said the claim was novel, but then they went on to look at um, inventor step. And they said that here, there was a reasonable expectation of success. They said that the, sit -up, the setup of the clinical study creates an expectation of success for the treatment of osteoporosis with zoledronic acid administered once yearly. And the expectation was not diminished by any disclosure of the prior art. And it, indeed, they kind of went further than that. They looked at the prior art in a lot of detail. And they said that um, many of the prior art documents disclosed effective treatment with bisphosphonates and this solid zoledronic acid was also a bisphosphonate and they said that there's no indication um, that the skilled person would think that the zoledronic acid would behave differently so in the context of all of that prior art the um, setup of the clinical study and those documents that were out there in the public domain they um, there was a reasonable reasonable expectation of success. And as a result, the claims were found to lack inventive step. So another, another uh, case on, on this topic, was there a reasonable expectation of success? So this, this case related to a triple therapy regime suitable for treatment of gemcitabine resistant pancreatic cancer. And here, there was a published clinical trial protocol describing a phase three study. So there was also clearly a publication of the results of phase one and phase two studies out there. But what, what's kind of interesting about this case is the board acknowledged that 
where you have um, a situation where development of a particular treatment is, is challenging and success rates of clinical trials are low, the disclosure alone of that treatment regime, so the disclosure alone of the phase three study, does not provide a reasonable expectation of success. So here, the um, gemcitamine resistant pancreatic cancer, there was a, a good argument that that particular um, disease was particularly challenging to treat. So if if you're trying to argue a similar case, if you can argue that actually for your particular indication, there's it's it's harder to predict success, then you you may have more uh, chance of arguing that there wouldn't be a reasonable expectation of success. They weren't successful here, and that was essentially because of the phase one and phase two studies. In the context of that, it was decided that really the skilled person would expect a positive outcome for the described triple therapy. It could be reasonably it could reasonably be expected. And one more European case. So this one is um, a dosage regime. So treatment of multiple sclerosis using an oral daily dose of 0.5 mg of fingolimod. And uh, the prior art reported the results of a phase two study and that used 1.25 mg. And then there was an announcement of a phase three study using either 1.25 mg or the claimed 0.5 mg. And uh, it was held that there was no um, disclosure of there was no destruction of novelty here, so that that 0.5 mg dosage, even though it was there in the announcement, there was no uh, clear and unambiguous, unambiguous disclosure that that actually worked. So, uh, so the claims were novel, but they also found here that the claims were inventive, and this um, was despite the fact that there was positive results in in the phase two studies for the 1.25 milligrams. But what what was really important here? was that they looked at the prior art and the prior art taught the skilled person that in order to get effective treatment you had to have to reach a certain threshold of lymphocyte reduction of at least 70 percent and the prior art also informed you that the skilled person would conclude that with 0.5 mg you wouldn't get that you wouldn't reach that threshold of lymphocyte reduction. So on the basis of that, from the prior art, the skilled person would not have expected um, that this dosage would give you effective treatment of MS. So in that context, it was found here that there was uh, no reasonable expectation of success and the claims were deemed to be inventive. So in the face of um, clinical trial documents and the disclosure of um, of those of those documents in Europe. What can you do? So, as we've discussed, the, the simple fact that those documents have disclosed does not necessarily take away your novelty and inventive step. Your claims may still be patentable in view of those disclosures, if you can establish that there was no reasonable expectation of success, and that's going to be easier if you're in an earlier stage of development. So some of the cases that we've looked at have shown that if you're already at phase three and there's positive results in phase one or phase two, that may be harder. You might also have more success if you can argue that um, development of a treatment is particularly challenging. And it's really going to help you if in the context of the prior art teaching, there's some things that might lead you to think that the invention will not be effective. So like in that last case, on the basis of, of the prior art teaching, 0.5 mgs wasn't going to give you that lymphocyte reduction. So if you can, um, if you can explain that, you might be OK. You might uh, be OK even, dis even in view of those earlier disclosures. So are you going to be OK in the US? Well, Yi Yi is going to take us through Sanofi Watson claiming um, to talk about the situation where you may have a disclosure already in the US and, and a strategy that you may be able to adopt um, to, to overcome that. Thanks, Maeve. So in this, uh, again, another famous case here, Sanofi versus Watson. 
Uh, in this case, uh, it's about a drug which is called Maltec, which is a brand name version of Dronidorum. Uh, this drug was known to be used to treat the heart problems uh, in patients with, with AF. However, um, Sonovi's, Sonovi's own, uh, own clinical trial studies later show that the drug also has a risk of doubling that mortality rate in patients who have severe heart failure through their own clinical trial study. Uh, so that's why in their later method treatment claims, they, they first of all uh, recite a method of reducing the risk of cardiovascular hospitalization in a patient. And also the claim uh, incorporates the patients that are, that are excluded from the study, which are the patients uh, with severe heart failure, which means the, the specific population patients they're targeting are patients without severe heart failure. The claim also particularly refer to and specify um, the risk factors in the, group, uh, in the group of patients, which has a huge category there. So let's look at their labels. Um, in the labels of the, for the drug, um, so there's an indication and a usage section, usually on the labels. In this section, they incorporate and refer to the clinical study section in the label, wherein the clinical study section refers to at least four clinical trial studies carried out by Sanofi. And in the, I, I can tell you briefly summarize what they are about. The first studies, the first two are uh, Uridus and Andonis. The two, the two studies were conducted in parallel, one in Europe, one in North America area. area. Those two studies were the first studies uh, designed to uh, to re reduce the recurrence of AF in those patients with AF. The AF. But when the uh, when Sanofi did a post hoc analysis from the study results, they found that the drug was specifically effective in decreasing the hospitalization rate of the patients and death. Um, and on on the, on, on, on in, pa in parallel. They also can conduct another study to test the side effect of the drug, which is the third uh, clinical trial study called um, Endomina. Endomina study, in this study, they found that, wow, by the way, in patients with severe heart failure, actually the mortality rate increased a lot. Um, and they had to terminate the study because of the severe side effects. Based on the two studies, the two pack of studies, they designed the first study, which caused the Athena study. In this study, they designed the study to, to detect the drug's effectiveness or e efficacy in reducing the hospitalization rate or death of the patients. And also they targeted the particular patients without severe heart failure. So those are the four studies. They were all described in the clinical trial uh, section in their label. So in this case, there, are two, there were two issues uh, before the court. First is infringement. The second is validity. In the validity uh, challenges, there were uh, the Watson used the two major pieces of prior art. The first piece of prior art is earlier reported results of the first two clinical trial studies. And in this reference, it talks about in the post hoc analysis, the first for well, the first time, Junidoron was found to significantly reduce the rate of hospitalization or deaths. The second uh, uh, prior art piece of prior art is the inventor's own publication. In this publication, they describe the rationale and design of the later Athena's trial. And in this article or publication, the inventors concluded that it was expected that the treatment with a compound will result in significant reduction in the need of rehospitalization for cardiovascular reasons. Um, we'll come back to this later, but let's talk about the infringement first. So uh, as you all know, in, in the US, to show induced infringement, you have to be show you have to show that um, the defendant possess specific intent to encourage another's infringement. Uh, so there has to be an intent, and also it's only liable when there's a there's an express encouragement for the physicians or patients to carry out the steps uh, of the of the claimed invention. In this case, when there's a label from the, uh, from the generics, usually the generics, when they wanted to uh, copy the, the brand name, they need to copy the entire label of the brand name. So it requires intent to encourage, it depends on the label, and label language must encourage, uh, recommend, or promote infringement. So in this case, remember, in this case, Sanofi's label 
they incorporate the clinical trial study section into their indication and use section, right? So the physicians will look at the indication section and provide instruction to the patients, but this section incorporates the clinical trial st study section wherein the Athena trial was described, wherein the specific population patients was described. That's why in this case, the court found, well, the label encouraged you to treat the particular indication in the claim and also to target the specific population you, you claimed uh, in the, uh, reside in the claim as well. And because most of the uh, the prescriptions were for patients with a claim the risk. That's why the court also found there's no non-infringement, substantial non-infringement uses such that there's no, um, there's also no, uh, there's also contributory uh, infringement as well in this case. Now let's go to the obviousness uh, validity of the patent. So the huge dispute was actually not on the motivation to treat the patient because that has been disclosed. It's about reasonable expectation of success. Um, so in this case, there are a battle of experts from both sides, and the district court credited Sanofi's expert testimony. According to, Sanofi, according to Sanofi's experts, reference number one only talks about the er, two earlier studies, which were not designed to investigate reduced hospitalization. Uh, actually, they were designed to reduce the recurrence uh, of the AF in the patients, right? So only the post hoc analysis was talking about the results suggesting only a potential uh, reduce of hospitalization without showing any expected expectation of success in the description. That's why prior number one does not provide the needed expectation of success. And regarding the second piece of prior art, well, the inventor themselves said it, it was it is expected that the treatment with this compound will result in a significant reduction in the need of rehospitalization for cardiovascular reasons. According to Sanofi's expert, it can be understood as nothing more than a statement of the hypothesis of what is being tested at trial, because at the time, the results of the trial did not come out yet, right? It's just that the inventors kind of optimized, you know, their, their, their hope, but it's, it's the hypothesis. It's not a real uh, tell you anything whether it's going to be successful or not. The Federal Circuit said um, they, they trusted or in, they, they credit the testimony of Sanofi's expert and found that in this case, it is not because of the, the simple hypo hypothesis of the result does not give you any actual data or uh, anything uh, solid evidence to support the success, uh, expected to the success. Indeed, um, remember we talk about there's a clinical trial study where Sanofi tested side effects. The, the, the trial has to be terminated because of a severe side effects. So that shows it could be it could not be, it may not be successful. And also even the EMA, the European agency also mentioned the failed clinical trial study in this case, a warning about the use of the drug in the patients before the, the, the Athena trial decision uh, outcome came out. So in view of all the other evidence showing the unpredictability and a failure, potential failure of the trial, uh, that's why the Federal Circuit could conclude in this case uh, there's uh, the reference number one and, and then number two in combination does not render uh, the, the claim obvious. And why does it matter? Because if you look at the Orange Book listing here, the, the first two rows are composition patterns of the patent uh, uh, of, of the drug. And you can see that oh, they both expire in 2018. While the third one, which is the method treatment claim, it does not expire until like 10 years later. It, it gives the patent owners 10 more years of protection on the market. And uh, Finnegan, we also prosecuted a lot of uh, claims, you know, throughout our practice. And there's one example where we used the Sanofi style claims and in the argument, the PTO was, we succeeded. It's another successful example. So in this pattern, the claim recites a method reducing the rate of composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI or stroke in the patient. Here we, we uh, recite the the patient population's specific po patient population based on the, uh, the clinical trial study. We also talk about administering the method wherein the the rate, uh, the, the we also incorporate the endpoint uh, of the clinical tra uh, trial study into the claim drafting. So in the file history, the examiner initially rejected the claim. That he said it, it was obvious because there's an article published uh, there's an article that disclosed the, the design of the clinical trial study. So according to the examiner, 
uh, is this this article because it teaches the same method treatment steps uh, in to the same of the same drug in the same amounts. That's why um, it was examining the same effect. That's why it renders the claims obvious. In, in response, we argue that based on the Sanofi case, we were making analogy to the Sanofi case. We're saying the statements in the article were identical to the statements in the Sanofi case, where even when the inventor said it was expected statement, but still it was really a hypothesis without any uh, results from the clinical trial study. So we're saying a PUSA could not have arrived at the claim invention until the inventors had collected and analyzed the data and uh, results from the trial. So just as the Sanofi case, um, this, uh, this claim really came from the results that targeting the specific patient population uh, from the trial, which was not reported in the earlier publication. So in the uh, notice of allowance, the, the examiner agreed with us and saying in light of Sanofi case, the speculative statements in the article are not sufficient to render claim uh, invention obvious. So the takeaway is, so again, when you have some early clinical trial studies, <clears throat> either, <clears throat> sorry, either through your post hoc analysis or through your new study, targeting a specific patient population with re particular risk factors, it is okay for you to draft claims to recite those population and risk factors. And also talking about showing, make it easier for the brand name to show infringement. And, and we think it's a good idea to match the claims with the label uh, of your product. <clears throat> because again, as soon as, as soon as the generics copy the label, then all your limitations reciting the claim will be matching what is in the label. It's easier to uh, do the analysis and show induced infringement. And the matching is, if, if it exists at the time of filing, it's, it's even stronger evidence to show uh, infringement. Yeah. Okay. Me, next section. <clears throat> Thanks, Yi Yi. So yeah, our, our final section is um, about the balancing act of when to file, specifically uh, with respect to how much data you have, how much data do you need to put into your application on filing. So we've spoken a lot about how uh, the fact that clinical trials have occurred or the fact that there are documents out, there is printed publication prior art, they um, they may affect your ability to obtain and retain patents. Um, so in view of that, do you not want to just file as early as possible? Or well, maybe you do, but are you, you may be filing at a point where you have very little data. So yeah, we're going to talk about some of the considerations about how much data you need and to what extent you can use um, post-file data as well. So I'll start off with talking about the situation in Europe. Um, do you need experimental data in Europe? Well, it's, it's not mandatory. You don't have to have any data, but it is really, really helpful. And it's helpful when establishing both sufficiency and inventive step. So um, for those of you uh, who aren't European practitioners, um, sufficiency is not entirely analogous but similar to um, US requirements of, for example, written description, and, and uh, Yi Yi will talk about that in, in a bit later on, but, but in, in Europe we just call it sufficiency, and your patent has to um, teach the skilled person how to carry out the invention. That's essentially the sufficiency requirement. Um, you can raise sufficiency as a ground of opposition. It's, it's often raised. It can be difficult. Um, to attack a patent for lack of sufficiency if there's at least one way of carrying out the invention demonstrated in the application. But strictly, the EPO should look at sufficiency across the scope of the claim. It should be possible to carry out the invention um, fully across the scope. Um, Post-file data can't be used when you're trying to overcome an objection of lack of sufficiency. The, the patent has to be sufficient, sufficient on the basis in the information in the patent application as, as it was filed. Um, but we do routinely use post-file data before the EPO um, to address objections of lack of inventive step. And I'll talk about some recent case law in that area later on. Um, so the, the two grounds that you're 
or, or the two, um, yeah, the two requirements that you're trying to address with, with your experimental data are sufficiency and inventive step. But you'll probably also hear from European practitioners a lot of discussion of plausibility. It's been a very hot topic for maybe the last, I don't know, five, ten years. And plausibility is, is this concept that comes up in EPO case law. Um, the UK courts are also really keen on this term plausibility but it's not actually in the statute so there is no plausibility requirement in the european patent convention but this concept comes up both in the context of sufficiency and inventive step and it's particularly come up in cases where um life sciences cases where there's a therapeutic effect and your your technical effect is a therapeutic effect. So, for example, a second medical use claim where um, the actual um, therapeutic effect is part of your claim or even just a straightforward compound claim. But actually, the compound is exciting and, and non-obvious because it has some sort of therapeutic effect. So this concept of plausibility it's, it's sort of been a hot topic. I'm not going to talk about all the plausibility cases and case law because that could be um, a whole a whole um, webinar in itself. But I, I want to give you a bit of a flavour of of where it comes from and and why this is potentially a problem and why this affects your thinking about data in your in your applications and how you might add data in it in or use data. Um, both during examination and maybe in opposition proceedings. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of cases here, uh, and they're kind of two ends of the spectrum, really. So this case here is a good example of a case that the EPO deemed to be just purely speculative. They hated this case. They didn't allow it because essentially the applicant was or the patentee was trying to claim something that wasn't there in the application as filed. So they claim this use for steroid hormone or analog, um, which fails to promote transcriptional activation um, for the preparation of a pharmaceutical for the treatment of AP1 stimulated tumor formation, arthritis, asthma, allergies and rashes. And there was no data in the application is filed showing that such a steroid hormone fails to promote transcriptional activation. And there was no data in the application is filed indicating that a steroid hormone could have any impact on any of the listed specific diseases. And the board concluded that here, the description provided, there was no more than a vague indication of a possible medical use. And this was a situation where even if you filed, uh, po you used post-filed data, there was such a fundamental insufficient insufficiency of disclosure of the subject matter that, that the patent was insufficient. It did not reach the sufficiency threshold. So this is just a cautionary tale that if you have a really speculative application, you're probably going to be, um, you're probably going to lose for lack of sufficiency. You're probably not going to be able to establish um, that the that the pattern is meets that sufficiency requirement. But then we have this case, T1616 of 09. And here, again, there wasn't much experimental data, if any, but here there was sufficient information in the application as filed that the claimed treatment was plausibly disclosed in the application. So here, the claims were directed to medical uses of a combination so there was a DNA methylation inhibitor and an anti-neoplastic agent. And the medical use was for treating a disease associated with abnormal cell prolifer proliferation. And if the board concluded here that there was absolutely no reason to doubt that these agents would have a role in controlling abnormal cell proliferation, both in cancer and in other diseases. And the claimed therapeutic effect was already known to the skilled person at the priority date. And it didn't have, there didn't have to be further demonstration. There didn't have to be experimental data in the application as filed. So the, the claimed treatment was plausibly disclosed on the basis of the specific facts here. So your application can't be purely speculative. <coughs> But it can be the case that um, you don't need much data or indeed any data if, if under the circumstances, for example, a particular combination, 
it would be clear to the skilled person that you would get that claimed therapeutic effect. Um, yeah, and I'm going to talk about briefly about G2 of 21. I see that we just had a, a question on it, actually. Um, G2 of 21 was, was uh, I suppose, I was going to say long awaited, but it was certainly eagerly anticipated. Um, this, so a G case, I explained about T cases earlier, for those uh, who are listening who aren't European practitioners, a G case is an enlarged board of appeal decision. So we don't get very many of these. So in Europe, we get quite excited about the G decisions. There's not that many of them. And usually you get them because there has been some sort of divergence in um, the decisions of the board of appeal. And the G decisions are supposed to kind of bring everything back on track. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that this one has done that. But the, the reason we had this decision was because it was felt that there was diverging evidentiary standards on this kind of whole concept of plausibility, which, to be honest, I find a little bit vague and nebulous. Um, but it, I, I think it's probably fair that, that different boards were using this concept in different ways. And there was a question about to what extent could you use post-filed evidence for determining the technical effect. So the technical effect is important in inventive step determination, but it's also important in sufficiency determination if you've got a second medical use claim, if, if that therapeutic efficacy is part of your claim. So to cut a very long story short, um, the, the finding of the enlarged board was that post-filed evidence can be used to support a technical effect. And you know we've been doing this for years before the EPO, so maybe that wasn't that surprising. But they've given us this caveat, which says that if the technical effect can be derived from the technical teaching of the application at the filing date. Now, quite what this means well, remains to be seen, and we'll, we'll have to see how the case law post this decision develops. But I think we can be confident that post-filing evidence can be used to support a technical effect. But you may struggle if really that technical effect deviates substantially from what you were discussing in your application as filed. If you're really going off on a huge tangent, then arguably that technical effect could not be derived from the technical teaching of the application at the filing date. But I was talking with one of my colleagues earlier about this and what, what this case actually means. And we, we think it probably is helpful in that it's a, it provides a clear path to use of post-filing evidence um, so I think we can be confident that post-filing evidence, post-file extra data is, is still something that we can use um, before the EPO, even for sufficiency, which, which is, I think, the question that came in here. Um, so your application has to be sufficient on its merits, but additional data can be helpful in showing that it was sufficient, if, if that makes sense. So over to Yi Yi to talk about experimental data at the USPTO. Okay, thank you, Maeve. So nowadays with the new decisions from the Supreme Court and local courts, it seems to be harder and harder to get a granted valid uh, broad life science patent in the, in the US without any data. Um, so first of all, in the US, post file data cannot be used to overcome a rejection for lack of written description because uh, uh, the description analysis is based really on the specification as filed. Okay, so it's related to the four corners of the description when you file the patent application. But it can be used, post file data can be used by a patent challenger or defendants in the case to establish lack of written description. So this is for uh, the written description requirement. In the US, for enablement, post file data generally usually cannot be used to overcome rejection for lack of enablement too, but it can be used uh, by, by a patent challenger or defendant to establish lack of enablement. We say generally here because there are limited ex exception if the post file, trial, file data, post file data was only used to show there's no undue experimentation to achieve the claimed invention. So which means that there has to be the data basis in the spec for you to further show uh, support the existing data in the spec. And it's not a, just the names, uh, numbers game. Quality of the data trumps quantity because we have here from many clients say, 
how many examples should I give in the patent? You know, how many antibodies and how many whatever you know sequence should I disclose? We always told them it's not a number scan. The quality of the data, the diversity of the examples you can show, uh, trumps qu uh, quantity. So, so here again, there's a classic uh, case here showing here the Abby case, the famous Abby case, where in this case, um, claim claim one recites a neutralize, neutralizing isolate, isolated human antibody, uh, and that binds to human IL-12, and with a particular dissociation rate constant. Uh, as determined by SPF, SPR. Um, the specification exemplified over uh, about, about 300 antibodies with the claimed features, but all the dis uh, disclosed antibodies, if you align them together and see the sequences, mo all of them have uh, almost at least 90% amino acid similarity to one starting antibody uh, in the variable regions, which means it, it seems to be obvious that the, the inventors got one good clone of antibody, then started making mutations on the antibody and making you know one or two mutations here and there to achieve a large number of very similar antibodies. Indeed, more than 200 of the disclosed antibodies differ only by what single amino acid uh, in the variable domains. So in this case, the asserted infringement product is another full in human anti-L12 antibody that can neutralize IL-12 activity. In this case, a defendant made a very uh, interesting uh, comparison of the features of the allegedly infringing antibody to the antibodies in the patent. It seems to be there's a large difference out there. So again, if you look at the sequence similarity, the only the, the alleged infringing product only shares 50% of similarity to the starting point antibody in the spec. And the CDR length and epitope binding sites and light chain types, they're all very different from the, uh, the antibody shown in the patent, which means this antibody that is presumably the patent owner assumes alleged also covered by the patent is very different from the examples shown in the patent. Um, but in this case, the, the courts announced that, okay, given the facts, the claims are invalid for lack of written description. Uh, first of all, the, the court understand, yeah, there are a lot of examples you give, but again, it's, you can imagine if you're talking about you're trying to draw a fence by your patent uh, around the genus, right? If you only present a small population of examples you know, at a corner of the genus, they're very popular, similar, uh, very close to each, uh, each other, there's a large area in the, in the entire territory that is not described that you fail to show your possession of it when you file your application, especially compared to the infringer's uh, antibody. So that's why, because Abby's patent only described one type of structurally similar antibodies, and those antibodies are not representative of the full var variety of the scope of the genus, that's why it fell to um, sufficiently describe the invention um, at the time of invention, that's why the patent is invalid. So again, a practical uh, tips from this kind of cases is be a realistic because speculative applications without any data support may not result in strong patents. Even if the examiner allows it in the future, you have to defend a patent at the court or before the PTAB and, and the, the, the challengers will be merciless when they attack their patents and try to pick the 112 uh, flaws. And if your patent data is narrow or inconsistent, is not perfect, it's worth waiting while you have better data. Uh, we always say it's a difficult balance between early filing date and the strength of the patent. Because, for example, if you have good in vitro data, right, but you don't have any animal model showing treatment of the disease, maybe you, it may have a hard time to convince examiner or the judges later on that somehow why your data can support treatment of a particular disease you're, you're trying to target in your claims, right? But on the other hand, if you have, uh, if you wanted to keep your claims uh, scope narrow, then you may not need so much data to support entire scope of the claim. Really, it depends on the balance uh, that, you know, through the discussion with the inventors and uh, your patent attorneys. And then for the data you, you do have, be explicit about the significance of the data, just like Maeve mentioned just now, um, because you have to show the therapeutic perspective. You need to convince um, the future. In the spec, you need to insert some language 
to indicate the therapeutic perspective of your earlier data. And if there are inconsistencies, be prepared to explain uh, the inconsistency, such as uh, the different cell lines or different animal models. There need to be some rationale behind the inconsistency such that you can use all the data without conflicting yourself. Um, is this still my slide? <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can comment here, Yi Yi, or, or you can start. But um, I mean, to, to be honest, I think that the, the thinking about data is essentially the same, whether you're talking about Europe or you're talking about the US. We use different terms to describe why you need the data. In Europe, we talk about sufficiency. In the US, you talk about written description and enablement. But in terms of data, what will help you in the US will help you in Europe. What will what will cause you potential problems in the US will cause you problems in Europe. So everything that Yi Yi has just said in terms of how much data and explaining the therapeutic um, meaning or, you know, why those um, lab um, experiments are significant, all of that is, is going to be just as important from your European patents as for your, your US patents. Um, you also want to think about um, your claim scope and the structure in the context of your data. Um, this is, I suppose, maybe more of a European um, consideration, because if your um, examples are actually quite narrow and they're clustered in a particular area, but the way that you've um, structured your application and your claims is that you've got really broad claims and then you've got specific species in europe it's going to be quite hard to get claims of an intermediate scope because of um, the epo's really really strict approach to added subject matter so when you're putting together your claims when you're filing the application and when you're putting together the application think about having um claims that really are a good representation of what's in your examples. So are your examples within the scope of your independent claims and at least some of your dependent claims? Really think about those dependent claims. Are they supported across their scope by those um, examples that you have? Have you got nice um, fallback positions if, if you are accused of not um, being sufficient across the scope? Um, so yeah, in terms of post-filing data, Remember that there are some circumstances um, where post-filing data may not help you, may not save you. So if you've got a significant sufficiency issue in, the U in Europe, um, you may not be able to rely on um, post-filing data it's, it's, if, if, if your patent is fundamentally insufficient. And as Yi Yi has just explained, um, as the patentee, you can't use that to satisfy the written description requirements before the USPTO. Um, you might be permitted under narrow circumstances to prove enablement in the USPTO, but as Yi has just explained, that may be uh, tricky. So going back to our why we're talking about this in the first place, you need to be really thoughtful about um, what data you have and is it the right time to file and it's really really tricky and and it's difficult to know what else is going on are your competitors filing applications in a similar area are there um, academic groups who are just about to publish things that are going to be relevant um, what are your regulatory colleagues doing are they about to um, make loads of submissions to a regulatory agency in another part of the world somewhere so this is it's not straightforward, but um, being thoughtful about it and, and not always thinking that you can rely on post-filing data is, is wise. And I think we're basically done. So I think it's back to Jamie. Thank you, Maven Yu Yu. Before we begin the question and answer portion of the event, please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation survey. We aim to provide programs that are va with value and to continually approve what we're improve what we're offering, and we'd really appreciate your input, which will guide us in planning our future events. It's now time to address questions that you've sent in during the session. As a reminder, you can continue to um, send us questions by clicking on the Q&A button, typing in your question in the window, and then clicking Submit. So firstly, a question to both of you. To what extent do you need human data when filing your application? 
Yeah, I can take a first stab on stab at that. Um, you don't necessarily need any human data, I think, is, is the quick answer. Um, obviously, it's great to have data from an actual clinical trial, but it's it's not um, not the only type of data that's going to be useful. Um, if you have data in either um, in vitro studies or uh, from animal studies, um, that can be great, but it's important to understand or explain the significance of that. What does it actually mean? So you don't necessarily need to do that in the application as well, particularly if it's like a really well-known and standard um, test. But I think it is just good to question your inventors and say, well, you know, does this necessarily mean that it's going to be effective in this particular um, indication in this particular disease? Why? Why can we assume because we've had these results in these particular cell lines that it will necessarily treat that um, illness? So I think it, it's good to investigate that a bit further and maybe provide a bit of explanation in your specification about that, or at least have some documents on file that show that there's a very clear understanding by the skilled person that those particular results indicate um, a particular type of efficacy. Is it the same in the US, Yi Yi? Yeah, pretty much uh, in the U.S., I, I feel like the standard is maybe even lower about uh, new, uh, no human data. <laughs> uh, but it, there, it depends on the facts, too. For example, there is a piece of prior art, right? The piece of prior, if you say I only so is self cell culture data sufficient, if the prior art disclose the, the general concept of treatment and also has some in vitro data, maybe there is a tension there. You have to argue both one or three and one twelve together. Um, but I, I, we, I, Maeve and I, we, we, told, we, we both agree that although human data is not required, we still recommend you to put uh, as much data as possible in the in the specification when you when you get it when you file your application. Yeah. Thank you both. So a question specific for Europe here, Maeve, and we've had this from a few people, and this relates to the EMA's new clinical trial information system rules. Um, so, do these change anything? Yeah, I, I think they do. Um, only insofar as we're going to have to be even more vigilant <laughs> in this area. So, for people who, who don't know, in the um, European Union, we now have a new clinical trials regulation, and one of the um, one of the aims, one of the explicit aims of that regulation, is to increase transpar transparency around clinical trials and that increased transparency is going to be achieved by publication of more documents and more detail in documents so you referred to the the ctis jamie so that's going to be the new uh system and essentially all documents are going to be in that system and and the default position is that once you submit a document it's going to be public so these are documents that you're submitting as part of your clinical trials um conducted um under the auspices of, of the european medicines agency so clinical trials carried out in european union countries so the the standard will or, or, or the default position will be that you have to publish more and there are some provisions in in the um, regulation that mean that you can get deferrals and you can redact some information, um, but those are reasonably limited and um, the, the deferral period is going to be affected by things like um, what phase trial you have. So for phase one, you might get quite a long deferral, but for phase four, you might, get, you might not get any deferral at all. Um, but um, you have to, I believe you have to request these deferrals and these redactions for each document as you do it. So for anybody carrying out clinical trials in the European Union, you just need to be really mindful of this. I think it, it applies to all clinical trials that um, started after the end of January this year. And from the end of January 2025, it will apply to all clinical trials in the EU whenever they started. So this has happened. It um, will have an effect. And I think um, 
we just need to be more mindful than ever of the potential impact of, of these publications on any patent applications that we might want to file. And it just means, I think, that regulatory um, people and patent people need to talk to each other and investigate the possibility of getting these deferrals. Um, I get the impression the European Union authorities are going to be quite strict and they're not going to they're going to limit the amount of deferrals. They're not just going to, you know, just grant them just because you ask. You need to establish that it's important because you, um, you, you know, there's commercially confidential information, for example, um, or, or, the, or it's uh, patient, confi patient confidentiality or something like that. So you need good reasons if you're requesting these deferrals or, or reductions. But... Um, yeah, it, it's going to be challenging, I think. Thank you, Maeve. Um, so again, another question that's come in is on the clinical trial protocols and in both jurisdictions, but particularly in the US, at what point does this become available to the public? And as a specific example that somebody asked about was what happens with the impact of treatment trial design and protocol publication on the clinicaltrials.gov website. Okay, I can start a discussion on this topic. Um, so first of all, uh, clinicaltrial.gov, they, they, when they receive the submission, usually they, they review in a very timely manner and they, they usually they uh, post it on the, online within 30 days. Okay, so sometimes it's within a week. and. What is counted as public disclosure for the purpose prior art? The date when the a piece of a person's going to have access to this web page without any restriction. Which means in the U.S. Uh, right now, especially from the PTAP, when you're challenging a patent for, before the PTAP, only showing the publication date of the clinical protocol itself may not be sufficient. You need to show at least some a PUSA, a person art had access to or had reviewed or click on the website to make sure it, it was really a public accessible piece of prior art at the time of the invention. And also, we noted that when we're dealing with different cases, many many for many times uh, it quite, uh, occurs quite often that the company drug company may change and revise their clinical trial study from time to time and resubmit to different versions to the to the uh, to the clinicaltrial.com website right so you, when you're talking about in for, uh, for the purpose of prior art you need to match the limitations in the claim with the language in the claim uh, protocol sometimes in the early version of the protocol the particular dosage was not disclosed the patient population was not finalized the risk factors was not determined, right? So the earlier clinical trust protocols, which does not disclose all the limitations, may not be so effective at, at the later one. But again, the later one has to be public accessible before the time of the invention to qualify as prior art. So those are the nuances you need to uh, make sure you understand. Yeah. Thanks, Yi. Are there any further European specific comments made? Yeah, I, I think with the, the new increased transparency in Europe, um, if your if your company is submitting things to the European Medicines Agency, I would just assume that they're going to publish them really, really quickly. I, I don't know, I, I don't have um, an equivalent. So Yi Yi said that in in America it's typically about thirty days or within thirty days. I would expect that in Europe um, things are going to be published very, very quickly. So do not assume that you've got any kind of um, lag or any additional bonus time once you've submitted it. I think um, just assume that once it's out of your hands and in the hands of the, um, the, the regulatory authorities, publication is going to follow very, very quickly. Thanks. And if we assume that this trial or this protocol does publish and does disclose the what you want to claim, are there any sort of grace periods that exist, particularly in the US, that could be used to overcome that? We believe it can be counted as the inventor's own publication because that's their own submission to the to the of the P, uh, the government uh, website posted, right? So it, we we believe, at least I believe that. Uh, the, the grace period still applies. That's why determining the date when it's available to the public, the person's art is going to be crucial date 
because you're going to use that to compare to the following day to see whether you passed the one one year grace period already. That's why, again, there's a tension. Uh, it's safer to use earlier publication of the protocol, but the earlier protocol may not have all the language you need for the um, for the challenge. Yeah, and, and from a European perspective, we, we don't have a grace period. There is no grace period, even for, <laughs> for um, the inventor's own publications. So do not assume that you're going to be able to rely on a grace period because it's, it simply doesn't, doesn't exist. Great. And again, moving back to the US and these Sanofi-style claims. Uh, so Yi, in, this, in the situations like in the example you gave, were there earlier applications with broader method of treatment claims? And if so, what's the best approach to take for arguing in the more recent application that there's no reasonable expectation um, for claims directed to, for example, a specific patient, patient population without inadvertently narrowing the scope of earlier broader claims? So in that case, we did not go back and study the entire portfolio. We don't know. We only know that the only method treatment pattern litigated at the court was the, the, the you know, very specific claims we we're addressing. But imagine their situation if a company has earlier, broader method treatment claim. We think it's very, very routine for them to have a later, um, more specific dosage uh, claim or more specific patient population claim based on the new clinical trial data, right? So compared to the earlier publication, the spec, the new spec will have more data description uh, regarding the results of the new clinical trial study data to support the new invention. So we believe that there's no such tension as long as you can argue to the examiner or the court later on, say, my new invention was not obvious over the earlier one because I have, this is based solely on the, on the unexpected new results we achieved the clinical trial study. Uh, and also, um, you have if you have additional evidence to showing the entire field is kind of unpredictable and difficult, that's even better to support your lack of reasonable, uh, reasonable expectation of success and to defend your obvious case against your own earlier um, broader claims. Thanks, Yi. And Maeve, early on in the presentation, you spoke about how clinical trials have been considered with regard to claims that were composition for use claims. Can you comment briefly on the concept of method of treatment claims in Europe? Yeah, I, I can comment on that. Um, so under European practice, we essentially don't have method for treatment claims that they're, they're not permitted. Um, instead, we, we use the second medical use format. So that is composition X for use in the treatment of disease Y. That's essentially how how such claims are, are formatted in Europe. We used to have the Swiss form claims, which was the very complicated, um, and I can't even remember it now, manufacturer of the uh, process for the manufacture of a medicament, something, something along those lines, which was much more complicated. But now we simply have compound X for use in the treatment of disease Y. Um, or essential, or you can have a first medical use claim compound X for use in the treatment of disease, just sort of broadly. Um, but but yeah, we don't have method of treatment claims um, just in that format. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, mate. Uh, so you, you spoke about the Amphi case. Uh, did the court in that case invalidate the patent under 102 or 112? 112 for lack of written description support. Great, thanks. Due nice to the breadth of the claim. <laughs> yeah, just purely Perfect. due to the breadth of the claim. That's why nowadays people are very cautious when, when they're drafting those kind of broad claims. Uh, the chances are is, is is unlikely to be allowed or uh, you know with uh, withstand the the the, 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 the you know like uh, remain valid after the court challenges. Great. And Maeve, as you mentioned at the start, a lot of what you've spoken about today has been focused on EPO case law on the decisions of the Boards of Appeal. Can you provide any sort of comment on what might or comment on national stage court proceedings or potentially even the Unified Patent Court that's now come into effect? Yeah, yeah, I can comment on that. Um, I have today focused on Board of Appeal 
um, decisions. And those decisions are influential for all the national courts in, in Europe. But as you may imagine, the, the national courts sometimes like to do their own thing. And, and there can be a certain amount of inconsistency between the different national courts in Europe. So if you do ultimately find yourself in litigation, um, either enforcement or, or invalidation proceedings in, in the national courts, you may find that they take a slightly different approach to, to some of these issues. Um, certainly in the UK, where I'm based, um, the UK judges seem to love this concept of plausibility and it seems to come up in an awful lot of decisions and the way they apply it is arguably somewhat different to how to how the uh, boards of appeal at the EPO, um, how, how they apply this concept of plausibility. So um, with the national courts in Europe, you can expect different approaches depending on your specific jurisdiction potentially um the upc will be interesting so um as i imagine most of the um, uh, listeners um are aware we've only had the upc and the unified patent court from june this year and we're still sort of awaiting um substantive decisions um so it'll be really interesting to see uh what kind of decisions they take on on some of these matters, whether they really follow the Board of Appeal um, uh, decisions or whether they take decisions more akin to the national court decisions or whether they just find their own path that will be very interesting. Um, I think some of us thought that maybe there wouldn't be much life sciences litigation before the um, Unified Patent Court and that life sciences companies would be a bit scared of it. But actually, we've already got some um, life sciences cases and there is actually going to be um, already um, Sanofi have filed revocation proceedings against an Amgen patent and there's a, um, a kind of a reverse, the um, so there'll be revocation proceedings and infringement proceedings on, on the same patent. Um, so that will be really interesting um, and possibly um, issues of claim breadth will be important there and issues of sufficiency will come up in that. So it'll be really interesting to see um, what the UPC thinks about some of these issues. Thanks, Maeve. I think we have time for one final question and this relates again to specifically to Europe, it was asked, um, to earlier clinical trials. So see, typically the standard with phase one trials phase is one that they are done in healthy subjects. Um, but when phase one trials use disease patients, do you think this has any impact on how the EPO will view the disclosure of the trial taking place? Yeah, I, I think maybe it, it doesn't necessarily change things and the EPO boards of appeal would look at it in the same way on, on, on the basis of the facts um, and they, they'd still consider was there a reasonable expectation of success. So I, th I think it would be the same considerations. I don't think it would be viewed in a substantially different way. Um, I'm not sure that's the best answer, but um, yeah, I think I think it would be similar considerations. And Maybe I'll think about that one a bit more and, and respond directly to the person who asked it. Sounds great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. For Oh, sorry. Sorry. I wanted to add more additional thoughts about the post filing data. I just forgot to mention just now. Like in the file history, when the examiner raised one of three rejections, sometimes uh, the applicant uh, can also submit post filing data to compare, uh, you know, the, the invention, whatever drug, versus the prior art raised by the examiner to side by side compare the security and show the security of the claim invention. That is allowed. Yeah. Just in addition to the 112 topic. Thank you. Yi. Well, thank you everyone for attending today's webcast. This presentation will be available on demand in the next week. So please do look out for an email from us with the access link. Uh, this concludes today's Finnegan webcast and thank you all for participating. <laughs>